Well, I'm not getting, yeah, okay, I guess I'll leave it that way, there I can see it. Yeah, they, they had a lot of interest and a lot of new people buying plants at their native plant sale, asking a lot of questions that, um, you know, hadn't been asked before. And so they, they put together this nice series of three presentations to start the spring off. Uh, the people doing the next two are, are all people who I've known, been familiar with for years. Um, Denise, next month, I've seen her at meetings and stuff. I know she's very well informed. In April, Monica and Sarah, who are, who are presenting in April, are both people who I've collaborated with and they're killer. They really know their stuff. So um, it's important that, you know, this talk is geared primarily to the upper Midwest. There are gonna be people here I've seen from all over the place. So some of the plant selections might not apply to you, but the, um, the basic ideas, the principles behind these ideas should be true. Um, so we'll be running through 10 things, which is a lot of things in an hour. Um, Number one thing, whoa, what's happening? Yeah, it's wonderful. Native gardening is just plain wonderful. This was one day last summer, I was walking out to get in my car and I looked down in the front yard because um, our front yard is a garden. And I looked down and I saw this, I had never seen this before. And I just squatted down with my phone. Most of the pictures in this thing were taken with an iPhone seven. Um, there's a few that were taken with a four. There's other pictures that came from other people and I will try to acknowledge those when they come up, but um, just squatted down and took that. That's a one moment in time, which all, all pictures are. Larry, I mean, which, yeah, which all pictures are. Larry Weiner, who's, who's a master in this business, he says that just as you can only ever step in the same stream twice, you can only ever look at the same garden twice. They're always changing. This was one moment around the 4th of July in 2017 when I got this picture. There's, there's things about this garden that are always the same, but the details are always different. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, all the life that um, these gardens bring into your world. Uh, so for too long, we've landscaped and gardened as if we want nature to go live someplace else, someplace that maybe we can go visit when we're on vacation. And we're running out of those places and nature's running out of places to be. And so we have this wonderful opportunity with any little piece of, of the earth that we have a chance to take care of. We have this opportunity to provide for nature, to let, let nature come into our world. And a lot of that is done by invertebrates. Sunshine comes all the way from the sun, plants convert it to chemical energy, but then our idea for so long has been that it should just sit there in these plants and be pretty. Or if you look at a lot of landscaping, it's not even pretty. It just sit there and look orderly. And, but to get passed into the, from the plant kingdom into the animal kingdom, we need insects and other invertebrates to help us with this job. So we need to help them in any way that we can. Um, there's, you know, the bumblebees in the fall, you know, when the days start getting cooler, the nights start getting cooler, the bumblebees don't go home at night. Whatever flower they're on, when it gets cool to the point where, uh, you know, they can't fly anymore, then they just sit there. And my wife used to find her five-year-old daughter early on those October mornings out in the garden, petting the bumblebees. They're very soft. It's a nice thing to do. Um, I love it when I find aphids, particularly they, they really go after the milkweeds. This is swamp milkweed. When you know that when you have aphids in your garden, then all the, a lot of different insects live on aphids. And a lot of different insects live on the insects that live on aphids. And it's just a continuing thing. And the more this stuff happens in your yard, the more resilient your property is and the more life there will be. If you see aphids and think that there's something wrong with that, then you're going to cut off this whole you know, food chain. So I love it when the aphids show up in my yard. I always know that, that means 
my yard is just gonna be much more resilient that year. And the pollinators, of course, pollinators are a big deal these days. They get a lot of press. There's a little bit too much interest in just the adult stage of the life cycle. So um, what we need to look at is every stage of the life cycle of these insects, not, not just the adult stage. And you know, here's a monarch on the left. This monarch is kind of old, his wings are beat up. It's a male because you see the little two black spots on the underwing. Um, but it, you know, it's not gonna last very much longer. The one on the left or the one on the right is a, uh, just came out of that chrysalis that it's hanging off to. It's still pumping up its wings, hasn't moved yet, hasn't flown, just starting its journey through, through that part of its life. But before it's in the chrysalis, it's, it's a caterpillar. And caterpillars, our native caterpillars are, many of them are very host specific. They only live, we know monarchs only live on milkweed. You know, fritillaries only live on violets. That's the only thing they can eat. Um, that's pretty much true throughout the lepidopterans, the, the butterflies, the moths, the skippers. And um, mostly they live in native trees and shrubs. So we need to include those in our landscapes. A flower garden isn't going to provide as much habitat for, for, these, for these caterpillars. Um, but, the, but a Norway maple or a ginkgo tree is going to provide nothing for them, nothing. And we, have, we can't have that. OK, so caterpillars are also one of the most um, perfect forms of food for a carnivore. And birds are carnivores, primarily, not all of them, but most of them. And almost all of our songbirds feed their babies almost nothing but caterpillars. So we need all these diversity of native plants to be able to feed caterpillar, I mean, feed caterpillars so we can feed baby birds. And um, what, what's happening here is the, I just got completely lost. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize. So how many bird, how many caterpillars does it take to feed these birds? You know, if you take a chickadee, which weighs a third of an ounce when it's an adult, um, a chickadee and its mate, in the 17 days it takes from when the chicks hatch until they leave the nest, they're going to have to catch thousands of caterpillars. That's an incredible amount of work in just a few days. So the plant, these plants with the caterpillars on them need to be close by, which means in your yard. Um, these aren't my pictures. These were taken by Doug Talamy, who has real camera. And who and Doug popularized this idea starting back in 2007 with Bring Nature Home. He followed it up uh, last year with Nature's Best Hope, which spoil, spoiler alert, Nature's Best Hope is you and I. It's people with their own property doing the right thing, getting rid of their barberries and their burning bush and all that stuff, getting rid of their lawn and planting native plants. Um, this is required reading. If you're new to this, you need to read these two books. They're, they're really important. Okay, here's something wonderful. The root systems of the prairie plants. They'll grow up to 15 feet deep. And then what they do in the winter when the plants die back, they die back also. And they leave all that organic matter in the, in the soil, which is carbon sequestration. Trees store carbon in their branches, but the ground, these, these prairie plants sequester carbon in the ground where it will stay unless we mess with the ground. So we need to mess with the ground as little as possible. Uh, all the way over on the left, you see turf grass. That's doing basically nothing. Um, I have a friend in the business who claims that he can grow turf grass roots six inches deep. Uh, that isn't really impressive. The other thing, when these things die back, all that organic matter in the ground makes the ground into a sponge so that stormwater soaks into the ground instead of running off, which is a big difference. It used to be that way. It used to soak right in. Now it runs off. We have all kinds of problems. We can help fix that problem with native plants, which is wonderful. And something that I really love about native plants is this is a garden I used to maintain for a client. 
a lot of gardens on this property, but this one in particular, the purple coneflowers and the black eyed Susans, these are short lived plants that produce a lot of seed. So they're not gonna live a real long time, each individual plant. But what happens with conventional maintenance methods with mulching and deadheading and all that stuff is that this, when I first started taking care of this, it was pretty thin with just those two kinds of, of flowers growing in it. And over the years, I let stuff go to seed. I let it hit the ground and, um, you know, birds ate a lot of it, but not all of it. And then in the fifth year, after it thickened up for five years in the fifth year, this great blue lobelia just showed up out of nowhere. I don't know if once upon a time, there used to be great blue lobelia in this garden or what, I don't know where it came from, but we didn't put it there and it showed up. And to me, that's pretty wonderful. So. Number two, it's not complicated. Try to keep it simple. Let's talk about site evaluations. A lot of people are gonna tell you, first thing you gotta do is take a soil sample, go spend some money to get it evaluated. You know, if you're, if you're putting a vegetable garden into it, especially into an urban site, there's a good reason for a, site, for, um, a soil study because there might be toxins in your, in your soil that are gonna affect your, your vegetables. But, you know, for, for gardens like this, in most cases, just ask some simple questions. Does anything grow there? If nothing grows there, maybe there's a problem. Maybe you do need to spend some money. Um, is it sunny? And if it is sunny, is it, because of a, is it because of a building? Is it because of a tree? And how much of the year is it sunny? How much, you know, is it wet or is it dry? If it's a wet place, then plants that like dry won't grow there. But if it's a dry place, it might be that just about anything will grow there. A lot of our plants like uh, red twig dogwood, buttonbush, bald cypress that we find in wetlands, it's not that they need a lot of water. They'll grow fine in a dry spot. It's that they're tolerant of not having oxygen to their roots. That's a big thing that a lot of people don't understand. So, um, so you know, keep these things in mind. Is it steep? Is it flat? Which way is south? Uh, I can't tell you how many properties I've been on where it was a cloudy day and it was a windy road. So I didn't know when I got there. And the client, when I asked the client, which way is south? They pointed the wrong way. Pull out your phone and look, it'll tell you. It's easy. It's important too. So you look at a site like this. This is in April in a wooded site. There's a lot of sunlight in the ground, on the ground. And when you have sunlight, you have flowers. Um, this is a uh, trout lily and this area, um, because there are no leaves on the trees yet, there are a lot of flowers in April, but later there aren't. Um, the trout lilies are amazing. This was in April and there was a mosquito on this. I didn't even see it when I took the picture, which is pretty wonderful. Um, there's all kinds of spring blooming things and they're important because the bumblebees are coming out of the ground at this time of year and they need pollen sources to, to stay alive. So we need a lot of our spring blooming plants, which are mostly more your woodland plants. So you can have those in a, in a wooded place, but you're not gonna have a lot of color in the summertime. You're not gonna have this in July because it's gonna be too shady. Flowers need sun, it's just that simple, but you might have purple coneflowers, which are a plant that grows along the edge of the woods a lot of times. And so if you have a, a moderately shady place, you might still be able to grow a lot of purple coneflowers. So, you know, use the plants that are adapted to the conditions of your site. Um, these plants have been doing this for millions of years. We're just getting started with it. They know more than we do and listen to them, watch how they act and respond accordingly. Don't overthink the stuff, just listen to the plants. They're pretty smart. Okay, some design basics. <coughs> Excuse me, some design basics. You wanna make your garden look intentional and you want it to be easier to maintain. What do I mean by look intentional? Um, a lot of our native gardens, uh, to be honest, are a mess. They, they, they're not pretty because there's just so much stuff. And, if a garden's in your backyard, that's fine. Um, in, the, in the backyard, you know, you, you're, where your neighbors don't have to look at it, 
But I think we need to put these gardens in the front yard. We, front yards are generally squandered. They're just something to look about. Well, let's give them something to look at. And we have so much beauty that we can put into these gardens. So we need to do it beautifully. And the way to do that is to make it to where when people look at it, they understand what they're looking at. We're hardwired um, from our evolutionary past that when we see a landscape we don't understand, we, there's a little part in there that says a saber-toothed tiger might step out of there and eat us. And you don't want to scare your neighbors with your garden. You want your neighbors to look at your garden and say, oh, I want that at my house. Not, oh boy, I wish they wouldn't do that. That's kind of scary. So you want it to look intentional. And the best way to make things look intentional is with swaths of color and repeating elements of color. Um, so, you know, those are, that's a butterfly milkweed and a bee balm. And then in this, in this garden, you see this garden's pretty chaotic. There's a stuff, a lot of stuff going on, but this swath of yellow through here and the repeating yellow elements and the repeating pink elements, those really help to uh, keep, to tie it together, to make it look to, the, the fancy word is, um, it keeps the composition legible. And that it's important that your composition be legible, that people be able to read your garden. Um, here, this is at the Shed Aquarium where my wife, Christine Nye, used to be the horticulturist. And you see the repeating orange elements, the, those are service berries in the fall, the repeating purple elements, that's um, aromatic aster, oblongifolia. Um, it's, you know, that's what, that's what makes it into a composition and people can read and people can enjoy. So you need to do that. This stuff is explained really well in this book, which Doug Tallamy calls the Universal How-To Guide to, for, to Sustainable Landscaping We Have All Been Waiting For, a masterful accomplishment. And it really is because these people are scholars and they have taken a lot of things that other gardeners know and have put language to it. Things that gardeners know intuitively, but have never figured out the words to it. They've put words to it, language to it, and it really helps to understand what it is you're doing. So they talk about planting in layers. Now layers, ecologically, layers are very important. Um, the interactions that go on between the different layers, and there's all kinds of different layers in a garden, in a landscape. But for design purposes, they're talking about just these three layers. Your structural layer, which is trees, large shrubs, great big perennial like the Joe Pye weed they show there, even tchotchkes, um, statuary, a gazebo. Your house is part of the structural layer that you build everything off of. And then you come underneath that and you lay in your seasonal theme layer, which is repeating elements of liatris and and purple coneflower like it shows here, but also the butterfly milkweed like I showed and all those things. So you have those repeating elements, but then the thing that really helps for maintenance is underneath all of that, you plant your ground cover layer, which is cool season plants that have the ground covered in April, which is when our cool season agricultural weeds are germinating early in the season. If the ground's already covered, not with wood chips that somebody hauled in, but with just the plants that are growing there. So then the weeds aren't gonna grow. Important, uh, important plant for doing this with is the sedges. You have to be careful not to use big sedges. You can use short ones. Sedges are great because in um, the spring, they're just, this is in April. When the trees haven't leafed out yet, a lot of the native plants haven't started growing yet. But these things are pumping the water out of the ground, keeping the ground dry enough that other plants aren't drowning. And then in the summer, the sedges are dormant. They're not using water at all, but every night they collect dew and they put it in the soil and keep the soil moist evenly between rains, which is really something. Um, this is Carrots Pennsylvanica pen sedge. It's a great one. It does keep creeping, it won't stop. Um, but it isn't very tall and it really does a great job at suppressing weeds. Um, here's some others. 
that um, are useful for this purpose. Um, here we have uh, pussy toes, which these things are basically evergreen underneath the snow right now. Um, for those of you who live in the Chicago area, we have a lot of snow. Some of you might not, but underneath that snow, the pussy toes are basically there covering the ground already. And then here is um, wine cups and or uh, purple poppy mallow, which cover the ground with layers of leaves early in the season. And then later in the season, they stand up and flower and put on a show. Um, this is called Robin's plantain, which is a flea bane. And look at the basal growth on that thing. It's covering the ground very thoroughly. There are going to be no weeds that come up through that. And our native violets, they, there's so much d diversity in our native violets. And they cover the ground early in the year. Yeah, there's the, there's the fancy name for them. And this is our side yard, which is a little tiny place. We didn't even bother killing the turf grass here. We just planted a bunch of native shrubs and small trees and let them shade out the turf grass. And these violets came in on their own. We didn't do anything. Some creeping Charlie came in too, but the violets came in and just made a carpet and they take care of weed suppression there. We don't have a lot of, I spend, you know, every year I'll, I mow a path through here twice a year. And that's about all the maintenance that it takes on in here. And then I do do some pruning in the winter time. Now, since this picture was taken, this was a few years ago, the trees and shrubs have gotten so big and the shade has gotten so dense that the violets are starting to thin out. They can't take real dense shade. So now we're putting in um, can our, our native wild ginger uh, because it can take a lot more shade. And eventually that will be the ground cover in there. Um, but we just put in a flat worth and then we're just letting them take over on their own. But this is my favorite. This is prairie smoke. This plant, it only gets up about four, five inches tall and um, blooms in, in April, literally. The snow comes off and the stuff greens right up and, um, and stays short. And all these other plants that you see here are going to get taller. So this is gonna create separation between the plants, maintaining the legibility of the composition. So that's wonderful plant. Prairie smoke, here it is. That was in April. This is in June when it's making its seed heads. They're a great plant. And you can take these plants and you can mix them in combinations because, and you can mix these combinations even more complexly because you're gonna see these from a distance. And think of your composition like a Persian rug where from a distance, you see the big bold patterns. And those are you know, the plants that I showed you before that you have big statements of them, but closer and closer, you see more and more and more detail. And the details are just exquisite. On top here is um, Cytote's grandma um, flowering. That's the pollen sacs hanging off of it. Below that is a single milkweed blossom. Um, we usually look at the whole inflorescence, but just a single blossom. And then on the right is lead plant, which is my favorite plant. It's actually more of a shrub, um, but look at that bloom. That thing is just gorgeous. Um, this whole business of the ecological effect of layering, um, it, it's worth mentioning that because it is so important ecologically for bringing as much life into your property as possible. And if you listen to the June presentation that Wild Things has going, um, you'll hear, hear Pam Carlson talk about the importance of layers and why she has 117 different species of bird in her yard. Um, but this book, Rick Dark um, and Doug Tallamy wrote The Living Landscape, and it explains layers, all the different kinds of layers um, very well. And so you get into that in a lot more detail. Okay, preparing the site, getting the ready, garden ready to plant. Um, your soil is probably fine. This is about killing stuff, all right? If all you have to kill is turf grass, well, you're in luck because turf grass is barely alive to start with. It, it dies pretty easily. Um, what landscapers like to do is cut your sod and haul it off 
Um, and when they do that, they take the top couple inches of your soil, which they then process and sell to somebody else who wants topsoil. Don't let them do that. That's theft. Um, keep the soil on your property. Keep organic matter on your property. Don't let people haul this stuff off. Um, you can cut sod and just flip it over on a small project. And what happens here is if it rains, you know, do this in the heat of the summer so it'll just cook. And if it rains, you might have to move it around a little bit, chop it up a little bit. But um, this after, you know, a couple months after I flipped this over, my wife planted a little herb garden in here. So that works. You can use there's the various lasagna recipes, um, put down newspaper and or cardboard, put wood chips on top of it. And that's great for killing turf grass. And also like creeping Charlie and clover and things that have shallow roots those dandelions and other things with a lot of underground storage, it's not gonna kill them. Though this method does not work for those, but it does work for turf grass very effectively. Um, so does the black plastic. I would leave it down June, July, August, September, plant in October, um, and it'll kill turf grass. If it's an area that has a lot of, um, where you know there's a lot of wheat seeds, you might pull it off at some point for a little while and let them germinate and then put it back on. But, uh, you know, it takes a while to make it work, but it's not gonna kill things with deep roots with a lot of underground storage. Um, chemicals work. Uh, this is an almost an acre that we've since seeded to prairie. Uh, and for a big project, you know, I just don't know another way to do it. But at, my, at home, which is a little tiny property, I don't use any chemicals whatsoever. There's just no need. Um, you can, you know, it doesn't take that much work to wipe stuff out. And so that's turf grass. It's pretty easy to kill, but there are other things that are hard to kill. Um, some of these, I'm not going to name them all. We've all experienced these things. Canada goldenrod is a native plant. I'll talk about it in a minute. Chip weed on the mountain, variegated gout weed. It has so many names, really hard to kill. I'm good. I, I, you know, I used to be a herbicide applicator and I'll guarantee you, you got to be good to kill this stuff with chemicals. Don't bother. I'll show you a better way. Um, all these different things are hard to kill. And even hostas and daylilies, if you don't dig them out thoroughly, are hard to kill. Okay, goldenrod. Goldenrods are essential. Um, in Oak Park zip code, the goldenrod, the genus um, Solidago, supports over a hundred different species of caterpillar. That's the most of any herbaceous plant. It's just, they're amazing. In the fall, they're, they're, they're late blooming plants and the, the pollen does not cause allergies. It's thick and sticky. It doesn't ride on the wind. Pollinators come, it's very important to have various kinds of goldenrod in your garden to support, supply that pollen for a lot of critters that are gonna need it to get ready for winter. Um, but, you know, so there are zigzags of goldenrods. This is showy goldenrod here. Blue stem goldenrod, which will take quite a bit of shade, is a great plant. There are a lot of good goldenrods, but the Canada goldenrod, it spreads by these underground stems called rhizomes. And everywhere where one of those stems comes back up out of the ground, it grows another, another, another stem which, with another flower on it. And they, um, this is just a first year plant. A second year plant might be two feet across. And, um, and it's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, a second year plant might be two feet across and have dozens or even hundreds of these rhizomes. So, you know, you don't want that in your garden. They're a very innocuous looking plant. Um, you see it, you don't feel like you're in the presence of evil, but you need to learn that search image. And when you see those, get them out of the ground. Um, goldenrods aren't any good. Um, rhizomes, underground energy storage. These are quack grass rhizomes. If you leave just, if you try to dig stuff up and you leave just an inch, inch and a half, of quack grass rhizome, you're going to end up with that garden having a quack grass infestation. 
it's just the way it is. Um, on the uh, on the right, the, I believe those are dandelion roots that you're seeing when the, you have that much energy storage, it's gonna grow back. So you can dig stuff up, but it's a lot of work and it disturbs the soil and more soil disturbance equals more weeds. So we wanna disturb the soil as little as possible and also more dis soil disturbance equals less carbon sequestration, okay? Plus, you know, plants put a lot of their energy, almost half of their work uh, is feeding the microbes in the soil. The, the microbes are the hardest workers in our gardens and we need to be nice with them. So the less we disturb the soil, the better off the microbes are, the better off we are. Give them a break, okay? So what do you do when you have something like this? This was at my next door neighbors. Um, and in this patch, you can't really tell, but almost everything I listed on that slide that I showed you earlier is in this patch. It, it, it's really kind of amazing. On the right edge is my yard. And my client gave me, or the next door neighbor gave me permission to get rid of this. And how I got rid of this is you know what it's like when you um, when a tree crew works in your neighborhood and they crank up that big old chipper and your windows practically shake? Well, when you hear that sound, go over and talk to them. Stay back, stay out of the way, don't get in a dangerous place, but eventually somebody will come and talk to you and ask them a simple question. Do you guys need a place to dump? And then chances are they would love to have a place just right around the corner to dump. And if they're cutting live green wood, it has to be green. It can't be they're taking down a dead tree. Live green wood, have them come over and dump it. And then spread it out maybe a foot and a half thick, really thick, and leave it there. And I'm not going to go into the details of how this works. I have a YouTube video. My YouTube channel is Ken's Hort. K-E-N-Z-H-O-R-T. And there's a YouTube video on there if you're curious about why this works, um, about, about this method, but leave it there and leave it there basically for two or three years. And then you can plant right into the decomposing wood chips. And it really works. Um, you say two or three years, are you out of your mind? Yeah, thing is, the five most important aspects of any good site prep method are patience, blah, 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 and patience, okay? It's just the way it is. If you're in a hurry, that's okay. Go to a good garden center and buy a nice petunia basket. And I'm not being facetious. I mean it. They're great. Um, there's some really, you know, don't go to the grocery store and buy that stuff they sell there. Buy a nice one. Spend some real money. Um, but if you to do this, to, to prep a site properly and really kill stuff off thoroughly to where it's not a problem later on, it's going to take some time. That's just all there is to it. Okay, planting the garden. When, yeah, the smaller the better, usually. Um, Adrian talked about the plugs that they're, they're selling at the uh, plant sale. And yeah, she's right. Um, First thing I recommend doing is in the fall when your neighbors are putting their leaves out on the street for the city to haul them off, go get them. Dump them out on your driveway and mow them up. The pile on the right is twice as many leaves on the pile on, as the pile on the left. Mow them up and stash them somewhere. And then when you're ready to plant an area, of course, you don't need to do this if it's got a foot of wood chips on it. But if it's a new area with bare ground, spread out the the old leaves on top of that, and then lay out your plants. And you want to use little plants. For one thing, a little plant equals a little hole. A little hole equals little soil disturbance. And that equals fewer weeds down the road. But you take these and you put, when you put them in the ground, you know, what you're planting here, think about this, if you're planting this many plants in gallon pots, how much potting soil are you buying? And why do you want all that potting soil in your garden? You don't, you want plants in your garden. Um, these are, like 
Adrian said, these are piezo plants. They're good quality. There are a lot of good growers for native plants, but these little plugs are definitely the way to go on herbaceous plants. Make a little hole. This guy's using an auger um, and there are augers you can buy at the big box store that you put on a power drill and make your holes um, to speed things up. Make sure that the top of the plug is completely covered um, so that the plug doesn't dry out and then water them in, which we'll talk about. Here's a, and then there's the woody plants. This is an oak tree that I transplanted. It came up volunteer in my garden and I took it over to somebody's house. Um, you see the bat, big tap root, people love tap roots, but what's really gonna sustain this thing, tap roots are important for the first few years of an oak tree's life, but what sustains this tree for decades and hopefully centuries to come is the horizontal roots, especially the ones near the surface. Research conclusively shows that the more horizontal roots you have near the surface of the ground, the more vigorous a tree is throughout its lifetime. So you wanna have lots of horizontal roots. You see in the picture on the right, the little slot that I've put through the sod there because I laid, I had a root that was a foot long and I laid it down out, out there. Um, unfortunately, in the nursery trade, most nurserymen buy in their trees in these little skinny tubes, which cause all the roots to grow down. And when researchers go into these big commercial nurseries and dig up trees and take the root systems apart and examine them, they find jumbled up messes. And these trees, chances are, aren't gonna live 50 years which is plenty long enough for a landscaper, but it's not long enough for us. So that's not a good way to go. Much better is growing in what's called air root pruning containers. And there are different kinds of these, um, but they're designed to make the roots grow out into the air where the tip of the root dies and then back along the length of the root, it branches out more growth and, and, the, and that grows. And then when those reach, out into the air, they die, and you get this fibrous root system like you see here on the right. Um, I cannot tell you how many workshops and classes I've been to over the years telling us how to take something like what you see on the left and make it to where it will work. Because with the roots wrapped around like that, it's not gonna work. And there's all kinds of methods for fixing this. Well, I say, why fix it when you can just not have it? If you use air root pruning containers, there are different kinds of them and you put them in the ground and they just take off and grow and you get all these nice lateral roots in the ground and a much better tree, much better tree. So plant, bare, plant trees and shrubs, either bare root or grown in air root pruning containers. These containers are only used by specialty growers. Fortunately, if you're in the Chicago area, you're really lucky if you wanna grow native trees and shrubs because Possibility Place, which is a supplier that uh, Wild Ones West Cook and a lot of different organizations use, they've been doing this for decades and they know what they're doing. Um, there are other growers. These things are becoming more and more available. Uh, Majestic Oaks up in Lake County, um, which sells to forest preserve districts and such. Um, they're, they're, uh, they use these methods. My wife and I found some pawpaws in Crystal Lake at Countryside last year. They had a whole section of native trees and shrubs grown in air root pruning containers. So they're becoming more popular. Don't buy anything else. You know, if you go to a nursery and they don't have them, tell them that's what you want and then go someplace else. Um, you wanna water things in thoroughly right after you do it, but you know, do it by hand, staying in motion. Never pour a stream of water on the ground. That drives the oxygen out of the ground which is hard on the microbes, it's hard on the plant roots. You wanna moisten everything. You're going after moist, not wet. So you wanna keep moving. You know, Think about organic matter. I mean, organic matter. Think about aerobic activity. You know, Just move, move, move. Water here, water there, go someplace, go take a nap, come back, water a little bit more um, with a spray, not a stream of water. If it's gonna rain, if you're planting and there's a storm coming, then water, um, because if the ground is moist, when the rain comes, rain not only has water in it, it has oxygen and a lot of nitrogen. 
And if the ground is moist, it's gonna bring that right into the ground instead of letting it run off like it might if the ground is bone dry. So rain is rain coming is a great time to water. Um, a lot of plants in my front yard, a lot of things I put in the ground, never get another drop of water. Trees and shrubs, yes, um, but don't do it on a, on a schedule, you know, every week you go water the trees and shrubs. No, every week you go take a soil knife, dig in, find out, is it wet or is it dry? And, um, and then decide if you're gonna water it. Okay, expectations. Here we have a second April of a new planting. Um, not real big yet, you know, it's, it's just second, second April of a new, great, brand new planting. But here's that same planting just a couple months later in June. So you see the stuff takes right off. But you also see why it's important to have those cool season plants in between. I didn't know about that when I put this garden in. Um, I'd also like to point out, you see there's chunks of wood around here. We took out a tree before we planted this garden and we had some chunks of wood that were too big for the chipper we used. And you take those chunks of wood and leave them in your garden because decomposing wood is very important for a lot of bees, beetles, this is a picture of a sphinx moth cocoon in, in rotten wood. You got to have, you know, if a branch comes down in your yard, cut it up to where it's not ugly. You don't see it anymore. Leave it there. Don't haul stuff off. Have rotting wood in your yard. They're important. And this is this same garden just another year later, June of the third year. Um, and what this picture does, this picture illustrates something that you have to expect and that's that you're going to make mistakes and i made a doozy when i planted this because you see in the foreground this grassy looking stuff that's palm sedge which we thought was pretty cool when we first experienced it we planted it in here we also planted some prairie smoke that you can see in this picture but over the years the palm sedge just came to dominate and it's so unruly and it, it totally ruined the legibility of this composition. I didn't know that terminology then, but you know, every year, you know, we said, we need to plant some more big things there because you can't see anything. Turn the whole part of the garden into an amorphous green blob. And that was just no good. So what we finally did um, after several years, I finally broke down and realized I'd made a mistake, admitted I'd made a mistake and dug it all out. And I went into the clumps of prairie smoke that I had planted years before and divided and moved them. And everywhere where you see red in this picture is prairie smoke where it used to be palm sedge and it works much better. So you're gonna make mistakes, live with it. The other thing that you have to expect is that you're going to end up eventually with too many plants and it's just gonna get crazy looking. And you're gonna look out at your garden and be dissatisfied. And every time we remove a plant from our garden, it looks better. And that's just a fact of life. So when, you, when that happens, you have to engage in an activity called editing, which is removing perfectly good plants from your garden. It's a painful thing. It's hard to learn how to do. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit later on um, in another section. But another thing that you're gonna expect because of your editing is that you're gonna end up with extra plants that you can give to your friends and neighbors. Um, when people come and visit us, they leave with plants. Uh, it's just a fact of life. So, you know, get over that idea, you know, I mean, we, we give away more plants than we buy. And, you know, we both, both my wife and I have problems in the, that we bring home too many plants, but more plants leave our house than come in. Okay, maintenance. Maintenance, I'm basically talking about watering and weeding. I don't have good watering pictures, so we're going to show you just some, some verbiage here. Um, uh, an established garden, you know, I haven't watered my front yard in three years. Twice last summer, 
we looked at the yard and we said, look at that. Um, you know, if it doesn't rain in a week or so, we probably ought to water that. And it rained within a week or so. Um, we hardly ever have to water our yard. Um, vegetable garden, that's a different matter. But for a native garden, they're adapted to our climate. Even they're adapted to changes in climate too. So th they can take it. Um, you're looking at moist, not really wet. When a garden is too wet, the roots start to rot and the plant responds as if the roots are dying. If a garden is too dry, the roots start to die and the plants respond as if the roots are dying. It's the same. And you can't tell by looking at the plant, which it is. Um, so take a soil knife, dig in, find out. Um, when, when things don't look right, figure it out because maybe it rained, you know, maybe it rained a lot and you feel like everything is wet, but the wind, wind was blowing. So on one side of your house, everything's bone dry. You never look, you never know just by looking at it. You got to go find out. And the best thing about any irrigation system is the off switch. Don't rely on these things. Don't let them tell you how to take care of your garden. Turn it on when you need it. If, if you have one in your yard, that doesn't mean you should tear it out, but you know, use that off switch. They're really important. Okay, keep in mind all the time that plant roots need oxygen just as much as they need water. Often they need it more than they need water. Um, so weeds. This is prey petunia, which is a nice little ground cover, warm season ground cover plant. Um, it is a true petunia, each bloom just lasts one day. But you see in the picture on the right, that clover looking stuff, that's a weed. Oxalis, um, wood sorrel. It wasn't planted there. It's a weed. I think it's really pretty. Um, you know, sometimes weeds, you just have to get over it. Um, some weeds are just so persistent. We need to make our peace with them. Some examples. If you can keep creeping Charlie out of your yard, power to you. But once it's there, you're not going to eliminate it. You just aren't. And you can make yourself crazy trying to. Wood sorrel is in every garden. It's in stuff coming out of commercial greenhouses from brand new potting soil. I mean, it's everywhere. You're not going to get rid of it. Don't make yourself crazy. Nutsedge, most places I've ever worked where we had nutsedge problems, all we had to do is turn the irrigation off and um, it went away. Yeah, so there are good reasons to get rid of weeds. Um, it's ugly, it ruins the legibility of the composition. It's about to produce a lot of seed or it grows aggressively by underground stems, rhizomes. But those other reasons that we kill weeds, that we go crazy, we didn't plant it that way. Oh, too bad, you know? It, I mean, it's just, you, how much work do you wanna do just because it didn't, isn't what you had in mind when you started? The plants are smarter than we are. Give them a break. You've always hated that weed, yeah. Um, so here's a weed that uh, doesn't look all that bad. It's kind of a robust, pretty plant, but I can see these flower buds and I know this plant well enough that I know once that thing opens up, um, the, excuse me, there's a cat on the counter here. Um, once that thing, once those, once those blooms open up, uh, it's going to produce seed really fast. So I'm going to need to get that out of the ground soon, but it's not a problem until that happens. It really isn't. Here's what I use to control weeds. Um, these Dutch hoes with the diamond blade, you shave the surface of the earth. You don't go more than maybe a quarter inch deep with these most of the time. So you bring up less soil disturbance, less new weed seed. Um, I use a soil knife and a pruners and a spade sometimes. The, um, you might wonder what have pruners got to do with weeding? Well, some weeds are trees. This is a little Siberian elm and where the arrows are, that's the soil line. If you take your pruners and plunge them in the ground, that far under, an inch underneath the soil line and cut it off, most trees grown from seed are done. If sunlight can't get to where you cut it off, it's not gonna grow back. Well, if it's a tree that small, why not just pull it out? Because pulling it out is gonna create soil disturbance. And the less soil disturbance, the fewer weeds.
here I am with one of these hoes. And this is a weed that has a fibrous root system. All I have to do is separate the crown of the plant from the root system, leave the root system in the ground, let it decompose. And this is a vegetable garden. So the nutrients in that fibrous root system I'm gonna, are gonna feed my food. Um, that's good. So that's, that's the way these things work, these hoes work. You just shave the earth with them. So what do you do when you have a mess like this? What is this mess anyway? Who dealt this? Um, the bigger leaf plants, those are purple cone flower. But in between that grassy looking stuff, that is all the atris, gay feather, blazing star. Wonderful plant, really bring in the butterflies. They're, they're great for butterflies. But when you look at something like this, what you know for sure is you don't need that much of it. So what do you do when you got something that is a good plant, but you know you don't need that much of it? Well, this was a little population of something. I wasn't absolutely sure what they were. Um, I figured because the green, the shade of green was the same as this plant right next door, that it was probably a penstemon. Um, but I wasn't positive. But um, I looked at this and I said, well, if those are penstemons, that'd be a nice little patch of penstemons, but I sure don't need those that many. So I came in with my hoe and here I go, a thousand one, a thousand two, a thousand three, a thousand four. In five seconds, I thinned that thing out using the hoe with one hand because I was filming with my phone with the other hand. And in a week, I can come back, maybe thin it out a little bit more. Um, if it's a cloudy day, maybe I'll transplant a few of them, get a bigger patch of penstemons growing there. But that's all it takes. That's all it takes. Preventing problems is the key to maintenance. You want to get them while they're little. And just chill out. Don't worry about every detail. I used to garden a 100-acre city park with a small zoo. And I never wore my glasses to work because I didn't want to have to see all the little details. I wanted to see the big picture, the big outlines. And um, it, it worked. People thought the place was fabulous. When I got up close to a bed, I could see the weeds and take care of them. But don't obsess over all the little details. Weeding just doesn't have to dominate your life, OK? Number eight, fall and spring cleanups. No, don't clean up anything. Cut stuff back and leave the leaves. Please leave the leaves. Why? Well, look at this thing. What you're looking at here is millions of years of evolution devoted to allowing this critter, this is called a comma butterfly, allowing this critter to overwinter in leaf litter. And if the leaves aren't covered with snow, then there's birds scratching through there all winter looking for little morsels like this. But because of the amazing thing that evolution has done with this thing's wings, they don't get found. This is a generalist butterfly. They can live on most um, kinds of native trees. The caterpillars can live on most kinds of native trees. So they, um, in the spring, they're laying there in the leaf litter. They're waiting for the trees to start leafing out. And then they fly up, lay eggs. And um, then, you know, then they're up there in a world that's turning green and they're brown. And they might stand out like a sore thumb and get eaten, which is okay. But they're, those eggs they laid are going to hatch and turn into the caterpillars that feed the first generation of baby birds in the spring. So it's important that we have these things, that we not mess with the soil. This is a polyphemus moth, which spends the winter as a cocoon, generally hanging from trees, but sometimes they break off. But look how that thing, it incorporated a leaf into the cocoon. It's just amazing. Um, and if these are laying in the, in the leaves and you haul off the leaves or you process the leaves or you chop them up or you rake them around, you kill these guys. These critters don't even have stomachs. They just hatch out for one purpose, and that's to lay eggs on the new tree growth in the spring and, um, and then die, hopefully get eaten. Uh, the picture on the right is not 
my picture. Doug Tallamy sent me that because he's a really nice guy. And he also sent me these. This is a Luna moth, which the cocoon literally spends the um, winter in the leaf litter. And so we want to leave those things. Here is at the Lurie Garden at Millennium Park, uh, spring cutback. And spring cutback is what the reason they do this with the head shears is that a lot of um, our native plants that have hollow and pithy stems are used by different insects for nesting. So we need to leave these up a foot, foot and a half tall. Um, sometimes they're there for two or three years before something even uses them. So that's what they're, they're all out there with their head shears, cutting things down to a certain height. And over on the right is our friend Roy Diblick taking a video of this process because it was a process he'd never heard of. And Roy is a gardener, so he's learning. Um, and that's what gardeners do. You keep learning new stuff. Roy and I have this conversation all the time that most of the stuff I'm doing now, five years ago, I never would have imagined. Um, you just keep learning. Uh, this is the incomparable Horacio Suarez taken down a big Northwind Panicum switchgrass. Uh, this is, I have four shots here from a, uh, a video that's on my um, YouTube channel. A minute and 22 seconds, he reduces this big grass to a pile of mulch. Um, it just doesn't take any time. And there, it, it, he spent this whole bed, which had a whole bunch of these in it, you know, he maybe spent a half an hour there, chopped all this down, it's mulched. You don't have to haul anything off. You don't have to haul anything in. It's just ready to go for another year. I took a little uh, battery power blower and blew off the sidewalk. It took me less than two minutes and that's all the work. You know, it's, this is so much less work than what a lot of people are gonna tell you it has to be. Um, number nine, other gardeners are your best resource. Like I mentioned earlier, eventually you're gonna to have too many plants. And when you have too many plants, you have to edit. But it's hard to learn to edit. It's, it's really one of the hardest things to learn I have found. Um, if you don't edit, you end up with something like this. This was once an award-winning garden. Um, it's not anymore. This guy gets tickets from the city. Um, his neighbors don't like this. If you can imagine, I doubt he likes it either because he hasn't edited things. He hasn't, the main maintenance hasn't, and it's a little tiny garden. There's no reason, you know, you have to stay up with this stuff. Um, but learning that it's okay to remove perfectly good plants is a hard thing to do. Um, you know, look at this garden. It's beautiful. And if it's in your backyard, that's probably just fine. But um, if it's in your front yard, you know, if that was right up against the sidewalk, no, people are going to be afraid their children will get lost in there. It's not going to work. You have to do things to maintain it. So to learn, to help people learn how to do this in McHenry County, where we live, um, which if you're not from the Chicago area, it's right up on the um, Wisconsin border, second county over from Lake Michigan. Um, we have an organization called the WPPC, which is very much like a, uh, a wild things chapter um, or wild <laughs> and yeah, the wildflower preservation and propagation committee. Um, and among other things, they have a mentoring program where people with an established garden will help somebody get a new garden. You know, people who've had native gardens for a long time, will help somebody new get started. And the, um, what they find a lot of time, and it's a great model. And I think a lot of other organizations should adopt this model. They do presentations about it, if anybody's interested, thewppc.org. And um, if you, you know, what, what happens for a lot of the people who plant these new native gardens is in the third year, they love them. You know, it's just so beautiful. And in the fifth year, they're kind of looking at them and they're scratching their head and they're saying, well, it's not quite as gorgeous as it used to be. And that just continues. So what happens is 
we've to try to fix that, we've put what we call the Helping Hands Committee together, which among other things, we have a team of people who go around when somebody requests and that, you know, this is kind of embarrassing because this lady has beautiful gardens and this is just, you know, probably the worst picture in her yard. Um, but we go around to people who um, request, uh, you know, some advice and, what typically happens, because people understand what their garden needs, the homeowner here in the blue shirt, she's pointing at these yellow flowers and saying, this used to be really pretty right here. And I think I need to just remove some of these yellow plants, but I've never done that. And we'll say, yeah, you're right. Because nobody's ever given her permission to do that because it isn't talked about very much, but it's something, that needs to be incorporated into our native gardening regimens is it's called editing, which is weeding out perfectly good plants. And, um, and it helps to have people come by and talk to you. So talk to your neighbors who garden, you know, talk to anybody you know who gardens about, you know, hey, will you come look at my garden? Tell me what I ought to do. Um, when I first got into this business, I, would, I was in a small town, but I was gardening in the park. Everybody knew the place. And, I'd drive down the street, see something cool. I would go knock on the door, say, hey, I'm Ken Williams. I garden the park. Uh, can I take some pictures of this? Because this is great. And gardeners love to share information, share knowledge, and they're more than willing to help. Um, here's some editing at my house. Um, we never planted common milkweed. It moved in on its own. Whoops. It moved in on its own. and. Um, it's a great plant, wonderful flowers, supports, it's, it's the monarch's favorite of all the milkweeds, I think. And, but uh, we get too much of it. So after it's done blooming, I remove some of it. And when I do that, I have to be careful and look for eggs, monarch eggs on the undersides of the upper leaves and for caterpillars. Now caterpillars, I just leave that plant. I can go remove it in a month, you know, it's no big deal. Um, so look out for these things. Okay, number 10, developing a personal relationship with the place. Um, the, the privilege of stewarding a piece of earth is, it, it's, a, it's a rare opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity. Um, Wendell Berry put it like this, the care of the earth is our most ancient and most worthy, and after all, our most pleasing responsibility. To cherish what remains of it and to foster its renewal is our only legitimate hope. There's nothing like Wendell Berry. And I love that he uses the term pleasing responsibility because it is just so darn pleasing. This is Royal Catch Fly. And every year I know, it's so pleasing to know every year that when I see these little red tips on these buds, that very soon I'm gonna have all this great red color. And that even the very next morning after I see these red tips, when the first bloom opens up, even before the sun comes up, I'm gonna have hummingbirds. Now, I take pictures with an iPhone. So these obviously aren't my pictures. These pictures were taken by Pam Carlson. And if you're not from the Chicago area, you'll, you won't believe this. You won't believe this in any case. Pam lives near the intersection of Harlem and the Kennedy, Interstate 90. And if you're not familiar with the Chicago area, this is a very busy area, very busy highway, fire station around the corner, right underneath the landing pattern for O'Hara Airport, crazy place, so much stuff going on. And Pam for 25 years has been gardening specifically to attract birds. Her backyard is 50 by 100 feet. Um, you know, just no bigger than that. It's tiny, it's a tiny little posted stamp. To date, she has documented photographically 117 different species of birds. And it's because of she's got that relationship with her place. This is not somebody who just gardens for a living. 
This is somebody with a day job who has had a day job for 25 years who, you know, but in the evening she, and her garden is well enough maintained that in the evening she has time that she can go out with a glass of wine and her telephoto lens and she can take pictures like this. And that's what it's like when you develop this personal relationship. And that way, when you see something like this, which looks like a mess, you know that this is the same thing, just a different manifestation of these magnificent beasts. It'll then color up into these things. It'll then bring you beautiful flying flowers. And you know when you see the orange of the butterfly milkweed that that's the same thing, just a different manifestation of these beautiful seed pods that will then darken and turn red and then finally open up and spread seeds all over your neighborhood. And you know that right now under the snow, the shooting stars are sitting there waiting to go. And in a couple of months, we're gonna have shooting stars in our yard, even though there's a foot of snow out there right now. And you know that you're gonna get fall color of every imaginable hue and that you're gonna get a changing view throughout the seasons. And you know that it's just plain wonderful. And that's it. <laughs>